ever wish you could like bottle that aha uh -huh yeah. feeling when you get from a perfectly designed experiment? Oh, absolutely. You know, the kind that reveals these juicy insights, but without needing a lab coat or test tubes? Right. That's exactly what we're diving into today, actually. Yeah, ready. Yeah, we're cracking open Chapter 7 of Research Methodology. Okay. A textbook that, let's be honest, it doesn't exactly scream like thrilling beach read, yeah. you know? Mm. But trust me on this, this chapter, it hides some seriously cool secrets about these creative experimental methods that can totally change how we understand like everything and not just for academics oh absolutely not like these methods can be applied to everything yeah from um marketing campaigns to product design yeah even little... like figuring out the best way to manage team right it's That's all true. that so the chapter it kicks off by kind of presenting this dilemma right yeah traditional experiments they're great for control but let's be real it's kind of like you're watching human behavior in a zoo exhibit. It's true. You lose a bit of that real world messiness. Yeah. That makes research so fascinating. Exactly. But then on the flip side, if you just observe the real world. Oh, oh it's a. It's yeah. chaotic, like trying to drink from a fire hose. Totally. Just too much going on to isolate what's actually important. It's impossible. Mm. So how do we find that like that sweet spot? You right. Know, that mm -hmm. balance between control and like real world relevance. Yeah, yeah. Well, this chapter, it throws us a lifeline. Okay. It gives us this whole buffet of creative experimental methods. I like it. We're talking like experimental vignette methodology, oh, EVM cool. for those in the know. Okay. Online experiments, we've got virtual reality and my personal favorite, thought experiments. It's like the research world is finally catching up with how our brains actually work. Yeah. By like imagining and exploring, playing with ideas. I love it. Okay. So let's let's unpack this a little bit. Okay. EVM first up. Okay. I love this one because it's all about like storytelling. Okay. Imagine this, right? Yeah. You want to study how people would respond to like a workplace dilemma. Okay. Say um, maybe favoritism shown by a manager. Juicy. During like a promotion cycle or something. Yes. Definitely juicy. But logistically, how do you study that ethically in the real world? Right, right. It would be impossible. Yeah. That's where EVM comes in. That's where it comes in, yeah. Okay, so tell us a little more. It's like you're creating a simulation. Okay. But instead of avatars, you're working with, like, real human psychology. Oh, wow. It lets you create these, like really detailed scenarios, almost like... Um, like mini-movies in people's minds. Mini-movies, yeah. Exactly. Where and you can control the key variables. Okay. And then study how people react to those. Do they speak up? Do they try to work around the system? You get at the why behind their choices. It's like you're almost reverse engineering the human decision-making process. In a way, yeah. And here's where it gets even cooler. The chapter, it actually lays out 10 specific decision points. Yep. You need to think about when you're designing an EVM study. Which is critical because you want these vignettes, as they're called, mm -hmm. to be engaging but also realistic enough yeah. so that the data you get actually reflects how people would behave in similar, like, real-world situations. Right, so it's not just about, like, writing a good story. Exactly. It's about writing a good story that's also, like, scientifically sound. Exactly, yep. yeah. And that's where those 10 decision points really come in. Okay. For example, one of the decisions is how you present the vignette. Okay. Are you going to use text, audio, video? Right. Each has its own strengths and weaknesses. And the best choice really depends on what you're trying to study. Right. You've got to tailor it. Exactly. So it's about finding that balance, right? Yes. Between creating an experience that's going to pull people in and making sure that your research design is like airtight. Exactly. And another decision point is all about how you measure the responses. Okay. Yeah. Are you going to use open-ended questions? Multiple choice. Some kind of behavioral measure. Right. So many options. Again, it all goes back to your research question and what you're hoping to learn from this whole thing. Right. Because ultimately, the data is only as good as, like, the design of the experiment, right? Absolutely. So you've got these 10 different decision points to consider. And the chapter does a really good job, actually, of like 
breaking down each one. It does, yeah. Giving examples. It, it even offers tips mm -hmm. for how to navigate those decisions. That's very practical. It's incredibly practical. It's like a roadmap for anyone who wants to use EVM effectively. And what I love about it is that it's so accessible. You don't need a PhD in statistics to understand it. Exactly. It's all about empowering people to do good research regardless of their background. And that's what's so exciting about these creative methods, right? They're yeah. breaking down the barriers to entry. I love that. And they're really democratizing research. I love that. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to another game changer, which is online experiments. Okay, yeah, online experiments, I think, are like... Um, they're wild. The wild west of research. Yes. Full of possibilities. So many. But also, you need a good guide. Totally. To navigate the terrain. You could get lost out there. Yeah. It's easy to get lost. It is. I mean, think about it, right? Yeah. You're suddenly not limited by who you can, like, wrangle into a lab. Right. Down the hall. Exactly. You need data from, like, I don't know, hundreds of kindergarten teachers. Right. Or, like, long-haul truckers. Yeah. To test your theory. Yeah, yeah. Not a problem anymore. No problem. Platforms like MTurk, which this chapter goes into, yes, have like changed everything. Completely changed the game. It's amazing. It's amazing. This chapter talks about how researchers who were studying very specific like niche markets, right, they were able to get their data so fast once yeah. they went online, rapidly accelerate their data collection. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. They were talking about gathering data in weeks. Yeah. That would have taken them years. Years using traditional methods with the old way right think about the implications for like actually getting products to market totally or services mm -hmm. faster 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 times money after all yeah. right right but okay it's not just about speed right and access to like this huge participant pool right this chapter really highlights how online experiments they can actually be more engaging yes. for participants Way more engaging. than traditional methods. Yeah. Think like interactive quizzes. Oh, yeah. Gamified surveys. Mm -hmm. Even virtual simulations. It's about meeting people where they are. Totally. Which is hurt. increasingly online. Yeah. And when people are engaged, guess what? You get better data. Better data. Yeah. It's a win-win. It's true. It's true. But of course, like, you know, nothing's perfect, right? Right. There are always challenges to keep in mind. There are, yeah. Just like in a physical setting, right? Mm -hmm. You got to think about things like bias. Of course. Yeah. Are you really getting a representative sample? That's right. Are people even paying attention? Yeah. Are they just clicking through to get to the end? Yeah. They just want to, like, get their five bucks or whatever. Their five bucks. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But the chapter does give some advice. It does. It does. On how to design online experiments that kind of mitigate these risks. It gives you, a, like, a game plan? A game plan. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It talks about attention checks. Okay. Ensuring data quality. Mm hmm Being upfront with participants. Transparency. Transparency is key. Yes. About what the experiment involves and how their data will be used. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a great segue, actually, into our next topic, which takes us from, like, the virtual world. Okay. To, well... Even more of the virtual world. Okay. All right. Virtual reality. VR in research, it sounds so futuristic. It does. Really. Like something out of a movie. I know. But it's really becoming a powerful tool. It's true. This chapter talks about how VR allows us to create these incredibly controlled environments. Yeah. But they're also like so realistic. That's it's like good. you're building a world from scratch, right? Yes. You're manipulating every single variable and then like you get to study how people actually behave in that world. And because you have that control, you can start to study things. Right. That would just be impossible. Too messy. Impossible or unethical to study yes. in the real world. Right, because you don't want to, like, unleash a bunch of chaos. Exactly. Just to see what happens. Got, right. This chapter gives a fascinating example. Researchers using VR to study bystander intervention. Okay. During, like, a simulated hate crime. Wow. Which is, I mean, it's a heavy topic, obviously. Everybody, yeah. But it allowed them to create a safe space to explore this, like, really sensitive issue. That's incredible. It is incredible, yeah. And think about the applications for training. Oh, yeah. Education, therapy. So many. Mm -hmm. We're just scratching the surface of what VR can do. Totally, totally. But as with any new technology, of course, you know, we've got to talk about... Soul durations? Right. Yes, yes. VR setups can be really expensive. They can be, yeah. They require specialized equipment, right? They do. And so that can be 
like a barrier to entry. For some researchers. Yeah. That's right. And there are, of course, ethical considerations as well. There always are. Ensuring participant privacy, making sure people feel comfortable in these like really immersive environments. Exactly. This chapter does a good job at acknowledging these challenges. It does. It does. And emphasizing the importance of those ethical guidelines and just planning. Planning is key. Planning is key, yeah. Don't just jump into the metaverse without a plan. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. But now let's um let's shift gears a little bit. Okay, yeah. To what might be the most accessible and budget-friendly method out there? The thought experiment. Okay. I'm ready to unleash my inner Einstein. Yeah. This chapter really like it dives deep into thought experiments. It breaks them down into four different types. It does. Each with its own purpose. That's right. Its own approach. Like having a toolkit for your mind. Yes. I love that. And no lab fees required. That's my favorite price. Exactly. So let's start with type I. Okay. Which the chapter describes as like the... Um, the detective thought experiment. Ooh, I like it. It's about confirming a theory. You have those initial sparks of an idea, and you systematically think through the implications of that idea. Okay. Remember Newton and his cannonball? Oh, yeah, yeah. Glad. That's like a classic example. Okay. Of a type of data thought experiment in action. Right. He pictured, like, a cannon firing a cannonball. Further and further and further. Further. <laughs> and he was like, what would happen if it just kept going? Exactly. Like, if it had enough force to escape. Earth's gravity. And it was through that. Sure, genius. That he solidified his theory of gravity. I love it. It just goes to show, right? You don't need a fancy lab or expensive equipment no. to make these groundbreaking discoveries. Sometimes all you need is your own imagination. That's it. And a willingness to ask. What if? What if? Yes, I love that. Now, type two. Okay. This is where things get a little more... Uh... A little more mischievous. Yes. This is the devil's advocate okay. of thought experiments. It's designed to poke holes in your own theories. I love that. Or challenge those widely accepted beliefs. Yes, poke the bear. Exactly. I love it. And who better to illustrate this than, of course, the master of mind-bending paradoxes. Exactly. Erwin Schrodinger. Yes. And his cat. His cat. Schrodinger's cat is a brilliant example of a type of two I thought experiment. It really is. Because it forces us to confront these bizarre implications of quantum mechanics. It makes you question everything. And sometimes that's like more valuable Absolutely. than finding an easy answer. It is. It's not about finding the definitive answer. It's about highlighting the limitations yes. of our current understanding okay. of reality. So we've got type sign two. Yes. What about when you have a pretty well-established theory. Okay, yeah. And you want to, like, really put it through his paces. That's where type three comes in. Okay. The stress test Ooh. of the thought experiment world. I love it. Okay. So we're talking about taking a theory that seems pretty solid Okay. on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. And you're seeing if it holds up yeah, yeah. under extreme conditions or completely new contexts. Push it to the limit. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. The example that the chapter uses... Galileo's famous thought experiment about dropping objects of different weights. Oh, yes. From the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Classic. I love this one. It's such a simple experiment, but it challenged centuries yeah, right. of accepted wisdom. It's so elegant. And you don't even have to, like, climb a tower. You don't have to climb a tower. You just have to imagine. Just imagine it. Yeah. So good. Exactly. Exactly. It's about stripping away all those extraneous details. Right. And getting to the core. The core of the concept. Yes. Love it. Okay, so type four. Type four. Okay. This is... Um, this is the big one. The revolutionary. Okay, it's time to break out the big guns. Exactly. Yeah, hit me. These are the thought experiments that aim to completely dismantle established theories. Wow. Okay. By exposing their flaws and paving the way for a new way of thinking. Okay, love it. And of course, we have to go back to Einstein for this. <laughs> his thought experiments about riding a beam of light oh, yeah. were instrumental in developing his theory of general relativity, which completely revolutionized our understanding of gravity, space, and time. It's hard to overstate how important that was. It is. Yeah. And this chapter highlights something really important, too, that um, Einstein, he didn't just wake up one day. Right. With the theory of relativity. Fully formed. It was the result of Young years feet. of rigorous thought experiments. Yeah. Of constantly questioning assumptions and pushing the boundaries of what was considered possible. Right. It's that, it's that, um, 
Discipline. That discipline. It's not about having a sudden flash of brilliance. Right. It's about cultivating this habit of like disciplined imagination. That's it. Of training your mind to explore new possibilities. Exactly. It's like, it's like that quote, right? Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out even Einstein, he had to put in the work. He did. It's true. And that's what's so empowering about thought experiments. That's true. They're really accessible to anyone yeah. if they're willing to put in the effort. So how do we actually like go about doing one of these? Right. Well, this chapter gives a really fantastic framework. Okay. It starts with asking the right questions. Okay. So like a mental checklist. A mental checklist, yes. Before we launch into our imaginations. Exactly. Before you go off into the um, vast expanse of your imagination, Right. the first question is crucial. Do you even need a thought experiment? Ooh, good question. Right. Is this the right tool for the job? Because we've got all these different methods now. you got options. You have options. Yeah. Right. You wouldn't use a hammer to tighten a screw, a result, right? Exactly. Tools in the toolbox. Exactly. So once you've established, okay, thought experiment, that's the way I want to go. The next question is all about visualization. Can you actually picture the scenario? Okay. Can you create a model in your mind? Yeah, yeah. That's clear enough yeah. to be your testing ground. It's like you're setting the stage. You're setting the stage, yeah. For like a mental play. Sure. And the chapter talks about getting creative, like borrow scenarios from history. Oh, yeah. Literature, pop culture, whatever helps. Whatever helps. There are no limits on where you can draw inspiration from. I love that. Right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right, right. The chapter even suggests like, Look at what's already been done oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in your field. Steal like an artist. And see if you can adapt those thought experiments to your specific questions. I love that. Yeah. Okay, so you got your scenario. You're ready to start experimenting. What's next? Okay, this is where that disciplined imagination really comes in. It's not about letting your mind just wander aimlessly. Right. It's about setting some boundaries. Okay. Defining the terms that you're using. Being really clear about, like, what are you assuming is true? Because even though it's in your head, it still has to be, like, you know, logical and... It has to be rigorous. Almost scientific in its approach. Yes. This chapter really emphasizes that. It even suggests, like... Write down your thought process as you go. Oh, interesting. Almost like you would if you were in a lab. Document it. Document it, exactly. Okay, so let's let's try this. Let's bring this to life with like an actual example. Okay. Say I'm researching um I don't know, the impact of remote work. Okay. On like team cohesion. Okay. What might a thought experiment look like in that space? Okay, so let's imagine we have two teams. Okay. They're both working on, like, identical projects. Okay. Same level of experience, same expertise. Okay, they're evenly matched. Evenly matched, but one team is entirely remote. Okay. Scattered across all these different time zones, ah, see. while the other team works together in person. Okay, all right, I can picture this. Mm -hmm. So then I'd create, like, the, these different scenarios. Exact. To kind of test out my hypothesis. Maybe there's a big deadline. Yes. Or, like, a miscommunication happens. Exactly. And how do they respond? Yes. Do the remote teams, do they rely more on technology for communication? Oh, interesting, yeah. Do they struggle with feeling isolated? Oh, good point. Right, and how does that impact, like, their decision making yeah, yeah. compared to the team that's face to face. So it's like you're creating this controlled experiment. Yes. But the lab is your imagination, which is so cool. And yeah. and what's really neat is that like even though this is all happening in your head, it can still lead to these really practical real world insights. It can, yeah. <sighs> you might realize, oh, there are all these challenges with remote work that I hadn't even considered before. Totally. totally. And then you can think, okay, how can we design better systems? Right. Or like how can we support those teams better? Exactly. And here's another piece of it, too, that's really powerful. These thought experiments, they can also help us bridge the gap between, like, different fields of knowledge. I love that. It's like cross-training for your brain. Yes, exactly. So in that remote work example, you might pull in things from psychology to understand the social isolation piece. Right. But then you also need organizational behavior. Right. Right. To think about communication strategies. Exactly. It's amazing. You're making these connections that you wouldn't have otherwise. Exactly. Okay. So you've done your thought experiment. You've explored all these different angles. You probably like filled up notebooks yeah. with all your observations. 
What's the next step? Yeah. What do you do with all that? Share it. Oh. That's one of the key takeaways from this chapter. Okay. These thought experiments, they're great on their own. Yeah. But they're even more powerful when you share them. Oh, interesting. Talk about them with other people. Write them up. Yeah, okay. Present them. Start a conversation. Get it out there. Get it out there. Because even the most brilliant thought experiment, it's kind of useless if it's just trapped in your own head. Right. It needs to interact with the world. It needs to interact. Exactly. And that's how we get that collaboration. Right, right. That debate. Yeah. And ultimately, those new discoveries. Because you never know who's going to hear that and be like, oh, I never thought about it that way, but... Exactly. Light bulb moment. Yes, that's it. And then they take it and they run with it. It's like planting a seed. It is. It is. You never know what could grow from that. And that's what I love about this chapter. It's not just like a boring explanation of research methods. No, not at all. It's an invitation. It is. To be curious, to be creative, to approach this whole thing with a sense of like... Adventure. Adventure. Yes. I love that. Okay, so the next time then that you are facing some impossible problem yes, or you're wrestling with some new idea and you just, you can't quite wrap your head around it, no. don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. To unleash your inner Einstein. There you go. Grab your metaphorical chalkboard. Play right. Start asking what if. Yes. And just see where your imagination takes you. You might be surprised by what you find. You will be surprised. Now, that's a thought. Thanks for, uh, for diving into this fascinating chapter with me. My pleasure. Until next time, keep those minds curious. Yes. And those imaginations firing.